Hey everybody, welcome to the New Market Alliance Church podcast, where you're invited to not just attend church or watch church, or in this case, listen to church, but actually go and be the church. For everything you need to know about our community, be sure to go to newmarketalliance.ca and maybe even drop us a line to let us know you're listening. We read everything you send and we'll be sure to get back to you. Our worship service happens every Sunday at 10 a.m. in person or streaming online. We want you to know you absolutely matter to God and you absolutely matter to us. Everyone is welcome and wanted. Now, let's join today's teaching. Glad you're here today because this is the last letter of those seven letters that Jesus dictated to the apostle John as maybe John was sitting on some rock pile on the prison island of, of Patmos in, in around AD 96. And this letter is to the church in the city of Laodicea. And it might be the, the best known of these seven letters. If you've never even read or studied uh, these letters or the book of Revelation, there's a good chance still that you have heard some of these iconic Phrases like, I stand at the door and knock. That, that verse has been immortalized in, in paintings like, like this one. Jesus knocking on a door uh, with the doorknob on the inside. I just if, Raise your hand if you're as old as me and you recognize some version of this artwork. Yeah, growing up in church. And those words are often used at like an evangelistic crusade or an altar call invitation, and rightly so. But interestingly, Jesus isn't actually talking to the non-believer in this verse. He's speaking to his church. He's speaking to us, to believers. What does that imply? It, It means that Christ is on the outside of his church, knocking to be allowed in to his church. I hope that gives you a bit of pause. It sure gives me some pause. It, this is the most memorable letter, maybe because it's the most hard-hitting. It's also the most inviting. Uh, first, though, Jesus, as we'll see in, in a few moments, he expresses his displeasure, his disappointment, almost in gross terms, purposely revolting language. I will spit you out of my mouth in one sentence. Um, But then on the other hand, a few sentences later, this invitation to to eat with me and I will eat with you and, and, and you will sit with me on my throne. Beautiful. But before all that, just like the template of the other seven letters that we've studied, uh, Jesus introduces himself to the church in Laodicea. And I'd say he does it in this letter using the clearest language of his credibility, his position, his divinity. He calls himself the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. You know, in our day, uh, I'm afraid the word amen has come to mean that's the end of the prayer. It's the period at the end of, uh, it's like punctuation to close out a prayer. But in Hebrew thought, saying amen is a way of saying something is valid and binding in the strongest possible terms. So saying amen is the way of saying that something is utterly trustworthy, utterly foundational. And here Jesus is saying, he is the amen. He is utterly trustworthy, utterly foundational. In Jesus, we see the real thing, okay? I suppose like at the end of our prayer, just like that amen, Jesus is the last word. He's the alpha, he's the omega, the beginning and the end, and he calls himself the faithful and true Witness The word here, sometimes, you know, I like to go to the Greek to sort of get uh, a nuanced version of what is being said here. It's alethinos, and that means genuine. It means the opposite of counterfeit or or fake. Jesus is the genuine article. He He genuinely 
represents the exact image of God. He's the absolute truth. We're having a a bit of a hard time distinguishing truth these days, aren't we? Like truth from, well, you watch some news stations and you're like, hmm, is this bias? Is this fake news? Is this a conspiracy? Truth from our confirmation bias, maybe? Truth from partisan news sources or people with an agenda or figuring out who the real experts are? Jesus says to Pilate, I am the truth. And how does Pilate respond? Kind of like a cynical Gen Xer. Well, what is truth, he says. Uh, We have 9-11 truthers. We have flat earth truthers, Sandy Hook truthers. Uh, How about this phrase that has really taken hold in this generation lately? Uh, I'm just sharing my truth. You have your truth. I'm just sharing my truth. What's your truth? Years ago, I used to watch this sci-fi show uh, called The (laughs) X-Files. Don't think less of me. And their tagline was, the truth is out there. And Jesus is saying in this opening, good news, everybody, the truth that you think is out there is actually found in me. It's embodied in me. I am not just truthful. I am truth incarnate. Powerful. And not only that, he calls himself the beginning of God's creation. Now, this is interesting. The Greek word here doesn't mean, you know, the first in the sequence. It means he's the source of the sequence. Does that make sense? It's like, Jesus isn't the first in the batting order. He's the cause of the batting order. He's the creator of the batting order. I'm trying to use sports analogies so Derek will understand where I'm coming from. (laughs) Creation has its origin and its purpose in Jesus. And like Paul says in Colossians, it's likely a letter, by the way, that the Laodiceans would have already read by this point. And, and many of you know this section in, in the first chapter of Colossians where he says, Jesus says, he's the firstborn of all creation. All things have been created by him and for him. He holds all things together. He is the head of the church. He, is, uh, he has the first place in everything, whether in heaven or on earth. And it's quite a staggering claim. Like if you think about it, it means that everything Everything in the universe has the stamp of Jesus on it. From the microscopic atoms to to DNA to the largest planets in the galaxy, it all has the imprint of Jesus. Something, right? You could say Jesus is actually stamped on our blood and on our cells and on our tissues. The the personality of Jesus is not just written in the text of scripture, but onto our very being. Wow. So if Jesus is the amen, the foundation, the reason, the, the source, if Jesus is the goal of creation, is it any wonder that Jesus is so nauseated by lukewarmness. Uh, A former atheist turned Christian, C.S. Lewis, said Jesus Christ uh, mainly produced three effects in others. Hatred, terror, or adoration. There was no trace of people expressing mild approval. Oh boy, I fear that mild approval might be the condition that has plagued the North American church. It sounds like it had afflicted this church in Laodicea. Think about it. Mild approval for the foundation and source of life, it's laughable if it weren't so appalling. Isn't it something to realize that our theology, um, it can be perfectly orthodox, And we can still 
make Jesus sick. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You know, the original Greek is even cruder. It it would have actually read as, I'm about to vomit you out of my mouth. Wretch, upchuck. Any, any others? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, all right, let's. Now then, um, have you noticed how Jesus leaves these little, we call them in pop culture Easter eggs, right? Uh, little references for the specific cities that he's writing to. If you're watching like the second Hobbit movie and you see a glimpse of Stephen Colbert, and you're like, he's dressed up as a Middle Earther. And you also know that Stephen Colbert happens to be a big Tolkien fan. That's what we call a little Easter egg, right? It's, a, it's super fans of, of Colbert and Tolkien might be the only ones who get that reference. But it's a little bit of fan service for those in the know. Well, in all of these seven letters, Jesus leaves some Easter eggs, some, some little winks and nods for, for people who would only get it, who were living in that city. And uh, I'll bet it kind of even made them perk up and say, oh, see what, you see what he did there? Uh, I get that metaphor. He's, he's kind of got our number. And the Easter eggs to Laodicea are far and away my favorite. Uh, you won't, actually, I don't think you'll be able to read these verses again the same way. Listen to what's going on in Laodicea, and this will all make sense in a minute. Laodicea does not have a natural, local water source. You know, we turn on the taps. That's our water source, and bang, hot, cold water. But back in the day, like, you needed a fresh, nearby water source. That's everything. But Laodiceans had to, via an aqueduct system, uh, made of stone pipes. They had to transfer their fresh water from miles away. This, uh, this yeah, was actually discovered uh, in the ruins of, of what is Laodicea. Uh, this is modern day Syria now. But um, like, what do you think the water was like by the time it had traveled about six miles through dirty pipes and then gathered in cisterns? Delicious, right? Um, at the very least, its freshness was gone. Uh, at very least, it had become stale tasting. If you think water doesn't have a taste, then you've never, A, had really fresh water, or B, you've never really had stale water that's been in a canteen for six days. There's a difference. Okay, but check this out. Six miles away in the city of Heropolis, they were famous for their hot springs. Uh, they're still famous for it, actually. This is a, this is a recent picture that tourists come to. And uh, uh, even that beautifully, naturally hot mineral water, as it traveled across the Heropolis Valley and spilled over a cliff near Laodicea, that hot water would gradually become lukewarm, putrid, actually. Uh, Not even tasteless and stale, it was, we're talking positively distasteful, distasteful, nauseating even. Now the locals would know better, but some traveler would come along and drink that water coming off the cliff and end up spitting it out. It was putrid. It induced vomiting in some people. So if you got this hot springs water at the source, it's actually medicinal, right? It's healing. They'd send people to these hot springs for for healing. If you got the cold water at the source before it was piped in, it was cold and it was refreshing. Laodicea got neither. The cold, refreshing water turned lukewarm. The hot, medicinal water turned lukewarm. You see where I'm going with this? 
See, I used to think, and I bet half of you when you walked in this morning thought the same thing, that when Jesus was talking about either being hot or cold, he's talking about opposites. Like one is good and one is bad. Like I'd rather be hot, you know, zeal, on fire for God. But cold means cold heart, unresponsive. Um, We think he's saying, I'd rather that you be an ice cold atheist uh, than a half hearted Christian. And at least there's some integrity to the, the cold heart. Maybe that's an argument for another day, but in this illustration, I don't think that's what he's saying. I think he's saying both the hot water is good, medicinal, the cold water is good, it's refreshing, thirst quenching water. What is not good is lukewarmness. Jesus finds it nauseating. And Laodicea was was neither hot or cold. The church was not providing hot, healing, medicinal water for the spiritually sick. And it wasn't providing cold refreshment for the spiritually weary. Therefore, they were totally ineffective And you could say totally offensive to God. I know your deeds, says Jesus, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. It it reminds me of this militant atheist, Penn Jillette from the the magician duo uh, Penn and Teller. Anybody... Does that ring a bell? Yeah, okay. He's part of, they're, they're this great, ironic, deconstructionalist magicians, right? And you may have seen them on TV, even some movie cameos. He's a militant atheist, like he's an evangelistic atheist in that he wants to spread the word of rejecting religion. But he had this encounter with a Christian, um, I just want to show you, uh, just so you know, the, the quality is not great. This was in the early days of what we call, you know, video blogging or vlogging. But it's right after a show, and this is what he says. And at the end of the show, as I've mentioned before, we go out and we, uh, we talk to folks and, you know, sign an occasional autograph. And there was one guy waiting over to the side in the, um, what I call the hover position. And he walked over to me and he said... Um, I was here last night at the show, and uh, uh, I saw the show and I liked it. I wanted. He was very complimentary about my use of language and um, complimentary about, you know, honesty and stuff. And then he said, "I brought this for you," and he handed me a uh, Gideon Pocket Edition. Um, I thought I said from the New Testament, but I also thought it was Psalms from the New Testament, right? He said, I wrote in the front of it that I wanted you to have this. And then he said, I'm a businessman. I'm, I'm sane. I'm not crazy. And he looked me right in the eye and did all of this. It was really wonderful. I believe he knew that I was an atheist. And I've always said, you know, that I I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that, uh, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think that people shouldn't proselytize, just leave me alone, keep your religion to yourself. How much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. This guy was a really good guy. He was polite and honest and sane and he cared enough about me to proselytize and give me a a Bible, which had written in it a little note to me. And I still think that religion does a lot of bad stuff, but man, that was a good man who gave me that book. 
Interesting, coming from, from an atheist. See, we have the greatest news imaginable, don't we? We know that on Christmas Eve, God became a human being. The one who lay in the arms of this teenage girl is the one who effortlessly spoke the galaxies into existence. We know what really happened on Good Friday, that Jesus wasn't just a good man who was the victim of a bad justice system, an unjust legal system. We know he was the Lamb of God taking on the sins, the sins of you and me and of the world. We know that on that cross, Jesus entered into face-to-face, hand-to-hand combat with the powers of evil. We know what really happened three days later on that Easter morning, that death was defeated, that sin found someone he could not contain, the powers of Satan were defeated, the grave had lost its sting. We know that right now Jesus sits at the right hand of God, enthroned at the control center of the universe, reigning as King of kings and Lord of lords. We know that one day, any day, He's going to come back and be revealed to the whole world. We know all of that and more. And it's a message worth shouting from the rooftops were it not for our lukewarmness. In fact, could lukewarmness be the worst kind of blasphemy there is? It says to the amen, the trustworthy one, that Jesus describes himself as, um, that he is somehow not worthy of our passion. Lukewarmness, I think, is usually caused by compromise. Um, I'm assuming the disciples in Laodicea were succumbing to some sort of cultural compromise as they had in the other six letters that we studied. They had some version of Christianity that allowed them to live for Jesus in private, and live for the values and priorities of the culture in public. But Jesus gets even more specific, more in their business, as it were. Uh, Of all the seven churches, this was a city that could say, I am rich. Uh, This is a day where you got rich by compromising. You know, we we talked about those cult-like trade guilds. Um, and they say, I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. Dangerous words, right? I don't need a thing. Apparently, it was the city's motto. Could be Canada's motto. Laodicea was famous for three things. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. Apart from having lousy water, they were famous for three things. First, Laodicea had many Banks. It was a rich city. Uh, in fact, in 60 AD, an earthquake leveled Laodicea and Philadelphia and Sardis. And, uh, and Rome offered assistance for the rebuild. And Laodicea was like, nah, we got this, bro. And, and they pridefully rebuilt the city themselves just using their own resources. We don't need a thing. Second thing Laodicea was famous for was its clothing industry. So they're like a combination of Wall Street, New York, and Paris fashion district. There was this kind of glossy wool that was sheared from a certain kind of of sheep that was raised nearby, and their garments were exported all over the world. The Laodiceans were known as the best dressed people in the Roman province of Asia. Third thing you need to know uh, that they were famous for is that they had excellent medical schools. So now they're like a combo of New York and Paris and Harvard. And uh, they were particularly famous for treating eyesight. They would, they, people would be sent to them all over the known world for this, this eye salve. Is that how you say it? Salve? Um, that was made right there in Laodicea. So wealth clothing, medicine. They had it all. They had, in their own words, everything we need. They sound kind of just like the secular humanists of our day who, who believe that we, as humans, are bringing about 
a kingdom of sorts. And, and through science and ingenuity and, uh, you know, the, the genius of man will, will be able to solve any problem that comes our way. We are a people who want a kingdom without a king. Now, here's the irony in all of this Christian boasting. Jesus quotes them back to them, which has got a sting. He says, you say that I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing? Yeah, we got this covered, Jesus. Thanks for the offer, but I, we're, we're doing pretty good on our own, thanks. You know, maybe there's a church in Africa who could use your help. I think it was St. Augustine who, who said, I have everything is a terrible saying when everything doesn't include the living God. You have nothing without God. And so notice how Jesus just rebukes them right where they live, right in that tender spot of their pride. It is a brutal takedown. He says, you say I'm rich, I have everything I want, I don't need a thing, and you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Wretched and poor, blind, naked. You see what Jesus is doing here? He's calling them out on the very things that they had put their hope and identity and pride in. Oh Lord, uh, Help us, help Canada, help NAC. It is the very nature and danger of lukewarmness to be unaware of your lukewarmness. You have banks, you have a, a first century Wall Street, a first century TSE. Nah, you're poor and wretched and you don't even know it. You got, you got money in the bank, but you're bankrupt in the things that matter, things in the spirit. What profit a man if he gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? Oh, you got the best eye doctors in the world? You got this special salve that will give people sight? You're blind and you don't even know it. You can only see as far as your eyes can. But of course, the whole book of Revelation is, is about opening the eyes to the real world, the unseen world, the way things really are. Oh, you think you're the best dressed in Asia? Listen to me. You're naked. The emperor's got no clothes. This one must have stung. The world was impressed. They looked like the Kardashians. But God was deeply unimpressed. They were naked, wretched. And yet... And yet, what does Jesus do with this wretched lot? Does he kick them out? Does he, does he leave them to stew in their shame? No, our Lord actually moves towards them. Uh, Daryl Johnson, in his commentary, where I've learned so much of the history and the language, says each of these rebukes in Greek still ends with the Os sound, O-S. And it's the sound of compassion. We don't have an English equivalent for that. Jesus does not want them to remain in this nauseating condition. He, he tells them to buy from him what they do not have. Buy from Jesus? I, I think there's a little use of ironic language here as Jesus uses their language of of capitalistic-minded Laodiceans that they would have understood. But really, he's advising them to buy what they never could with money. And in doing so, shows them that the greatest riches really only come by grace. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also, buy white garments for me so you'll not be shamed by your nakedness. Buy ointment for your eyes so you'll be able to see. Buy it from me, from me. That's the key phrase in this council. Jesus says, 
I have the true riches. I have the clothing that will cover your shame. Only I can give you the eyes that can really see. What grace, what unearned, unmerited favor is that? He's nauseated with our lukewarmness, and what does Jesus do? He opens the storehouse of heaven with these eternal gifts. And here's what Jesus is saying to the Laodiceans, and I can't help but think that he might just be saying it to us this morning. So for those with ears to hear, may you hear. Church, if you would just recognize your poverty, your soul poverty, I will enrich you beyond your wildest imagination. If you would just recognize your shameful nakedness, that you're not fooling anyone, you're not impressing anyone, then I will clothe you with my garments. I'll cover your shame. If you would just recognize how irredeemably blind you are, I'll give you my eyes to see what you've never seen before. These are not angry words. They're words of compassion. He says, those who I love, I rebuke and discipline. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Whom I love. Will you say those three words with me? Whom I love. One more time. Whom I love. I want you to hear this this morning. The word Jesus usually uses for love is the word agape. Many of you will be familiar with that word. It's the, it's the word meaning decision love. Love is an act of our will. Love is a choice. Beautiful word. Check this out. In this instance, Jesus uses the word filio, affectionate love, love that stirs the emotion, love that actually likes being with you. So Jesus not only chooses to love those who made him sick with their lukewarmness, he actually feels love for them. He loves you, but check this out. He likes you. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. The God of the universe likes you. He's fond of you. So how? How do we move from being nauseatingly lukewarm to healing hot or refreshingly, restoringly cold? Look, Jesus says. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. See, this is the root cause of, of lukewarmness, excluding Jesus. It's, it's as simple and it's as tragic as that. I stand at the door and knock. He's outside and he wants to come in. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. And yes, um, those are appropriate words for those who've never accepted Christ and are now feeling the, the warm invitation from him. But they are actually a words dressed, addressed to the church, uh, to believers, to Christians who, who have excluded Jesus. Folks, let me ask, where, where have you excluded Jesus? What area of your life have you excluded Jesus And yet, out of sheer grace, he stands, knocking, waiting. Listen, the solution to lukewarmness is not to muster up some emotionality, you know, just just feeling, you know, I need to raise my hands higher in worship. No, the solution is not to double your Bible reading plan. The solution is to open the door again to Jesus. You know, as a kid raised on 80s cop shows and movies, uh, you would think every detective opened a door by kicking it in. Do you remember this? I used to think as a kid, like, 
Is it that easy? I'm surprised there's not more break-ins if doors are so kickable. Uh, And here's the thing. You think Jesus could just kick down your door. He could. He won't. He's gentle. Sometimes as a pastor, I wish he would bust a few doors down. Bust some doors down of people who are hard-hearted and obstinate. Sometimes I wish he'd kick my door down. You know what I'm saying? But that's not how he rolls. He invites He makes this beautiful invitation. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. You know, even to this day in the Middle East, this is a way of saying we will make a friendship covenant, not just to share a meal, but to share all that I am with you. Those who are victorious, he says, will sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Jesus comes through the door not only to sit at the table with us, but to lift us up to his throne. If only we would let him in. Um, You may never have even turned the handle, but you know that you're spiritually bankrupt You're spiritually naked and blind. And you know what? I'd say you're blessed. You're in a perfect place because you know your need for Jesus. Oh, that's a good place to be. Open the door. Jesus will come in. And for some of us old grizzled veterans of the faith, we may have opened the door years ago, but for whatever reason, we have slowly excluded him. And and that's maybe why it feels so stale and empty. Welcome him back in. Turn the handle again. He will come in. Uh, Maybe you've opened the front door of your house. You've allowed Jesus into the front room, the living room, the guest room. But there are some rooms that you won't give him access to. They're locked rooms. And he stands at the door of those secret rooms and he knocks and he won't be satisfied until he gets full access, but he won't knock down those doors. Will you open the door to him? Let him in the family room. Let him in the office. Uh, Let him in the attic where all the memories are hidden. Let him in the room called finances. Let him in the room called sexuality. Let him in the room called anger. Look, I'm standing at the door and knocking. Will you do it? Will you let him in? Father, I want to thank you for your son Jesus who makes this beautiful offer to come. To come to me all who are weary, heavy laden, He'll give us rest. He's knocking on the door of our church. Will we let him in? He's knocking on the door of our heart. Will we let him in? I pray that you would speak, Lord, speak clearly to those in this room today. Amen. Let me invite the band to come. And I would like us to respond just in a little different way this morning. Last Good Friday, one of our stations in our prayer exercise was a, was a letter writing station. You can see some of those letters over there. They're all anonymous. And uh, the idea was to listen to what Jesus might say to us in 2022. I think every letter to these ancient churches had something really profound to say to our church today. But Jesus continues to speak, doesn't he? And I wonder if he if he might have a prophetic word for us today. Um, uh, Can I just read a few of these that that came last Friday? They're all anonymous. I don't know who wrote them. Say, uh, Dear Knack, your efforts to welcome new people, I see them and I love them as they enter. But why do you stop there? Foster deeper, more meaningful connections with others beyond the hello on a Sunday morning. And if you dig deep, 
and create these connections, I will bless you, not only in numbers, but in fellowship and relationship. Dear Knack, I see your longing for more of me and your genuine heart to bring me praise, but I have this against you. Your pace is too fast. Slow down, be present, learn and hear my voice. Do away with all the distractions, make more time for me. And if you walk with me, I will draw close to you and bless you with my peace, joy, love, and voice. How precious is your voice, Lord. Dear Knack, I see your heart to worship me, but I say to you, worship with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. Let go and do not hold back in worship. Much is accomplished in the spiritual realm when you worship. Psalm 8, verse 2, you have taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. Dear Church of Canada, I see your work, your efforts, and what you have done. It has been fantastic and lives have been changed, but I have this against you. In whose name are these things being done? To whom does the glory belong? Therefore, hear me. I am not hidden, but I am still, I'm that still small voice instructing you, guiding you. Quiet your hearts and minds. Let go of all the busyness and hear me. And I will show you just what I plan for you and what you are capable of and what I am capable of. Dear Knack, I see your heart to be truly the church, a light sharing the gospel to those around us. But I have this against you. Stop trying to do this on your own strength. Draw close to me and pray for me to open the door. Dear Knack, I see the love you have for one another and your community as a whole but I have this against you. You remain divided by petty disagreements and past qualms with one another. Therefore, speak honestly with one another and seek to end those disagreements. And if you can learn to love unconditionally, you will know the type of love that Jesus has for his church. Dear churches of North America, I see your desire to spread the good word and bring others to eternal life but I have this against you. Homophobia, judgment, and hate will not show people the love of God. Therefore, love one another, even if they do things you disagree with. Be kind. And if you show God's love the true way, I will feel more comfortable sharing God's word with others. Some examples. And so over the next two songs, I'm gonna ask, well, really give you the gift of sitting, listening, reflecting. It might be the only 10 minutes in your whole week where you've gotten a chance just to reflect. And I'm wondering if you would ask Jesus what he might be saying to you, what he might be saying to the Canadian church, what he might be saying to New Market Alliance Church.